Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Gazing at the Galaxies, uh, our second impromptu lockdown, well, post-lockdown now, uh, live stream from the ASV. Tonight, we're going to be focusing on galaxies, and we will be working around clouds, so please bear with us. Um, as always, if you've got questions about the objects we're looking at, please pop them in the chat and we will uh, get to them as best we can. But first, I'd like to introduce you to our special comments, guys. Um, I am Steve and Rocket, Stefan. How are you going, guys? Good, uh, thank you. Now, I'll now bring in our astrophotographers for the night. We're going to be attempting to image for us live as the night unfolds. Um, so we have Michael, Captain America, Matiazzo from Swan Hill. We have Anne-Marie Gamora from uh, out Molden Way. <laughs> I forgot where Anne-Marie's from exactly. We have Thor, who comes to us all the way from Asgard. I mean, he may as well have you so far away. He's near the uh, <laughs> South Australian border. He's pretty much Asgard. And Drax, and nothing gets past Drax. Not even Baby Group. Welcome, guys. So Welcome. Evening. Well, now uh, what we're going to do now is just pass it over to um, Rocket, who's going to tell us a little bit about galaxies before we start looking at uh, the live stack images that the guys have got uh, hiding in the background. So, Rocket, it's all yours. All right. Yeah, so I thought that it might be beneficial uh, to give a bit of an introduction into a little bit about what galaxies are for anyone in the audience who isn't um, already familiar. So basically, almost exactly 100 years ago today, there was a really great debate raging between uh, astrophysicists. And that debate was about what galaxies actually are. There was one side which was arguing that these so-called spiral nebulae were just that, little spiral-like peculiar things within our own Milky Way galaxy. And then the other side was arguing that, no, actually, these are island universes in and of themselves, separate from our Milky Way galaxy and far, far off in the distance. And it wasn't really until um, a great astrophysicist, Edwin Hubble, was able to make accurate measurements of the distances of these galaxies, did we really realize that, oh, these actually are little island universes in and of themselves far, far away outside of our own Milky Way galaxy. And that realization really exploded how large our con concept of the universe really was. Um, suddenly these galaxies, you know, weren't just within our own Milky Way, they were very, very huge enormous structures very, very far off in the distance. And so here um, I've shown a diagram which is known as the Hubble uh, de Vecoeur diagram. So this, this was um, essentially an idea that was started by Edwin Hubble um, in the 1930s. Uh, and it was an attempt to start to try and characterize some of the common structures of galaxies. Um, because at the time, like I said, it was new information that these were actually separate entities from our own Milky Way. And this may look complicated, but really all it's saying is that there are four general shapes, four morphologies that galaxies tend to adopt. These are the elliptical galaxies that you see on the left here, the spiral galaxies up here and down here, including some of these intermediate spirals, and then irregular galaxies. And all galaxies that we see fall within this uh, general structure. So elliptical galaxies tend to be these really, really massive, bloated, um, globular-shaped things. You can see on one end that you can find some that are basically purely spherical, and then some which are more elongated, more football-shaped, uh, even cigar-shaped. And then you come to the intersection between ellipticals and spiral galaxies. Of course, spiral galaxies are what everyone pictures when they hear the word galaxy. These grand design sort of spiraling whirlpool looking structures. And there are many different kinds of spiral galaxies. You can see that here there's a distinction between the uh, unbarred spiral galaxies, which don't have a bar in their central core, and then those that do have a bar. 
Um, so that sort of delineates between a couple major types, the barred spiral galaxies and the um, real spiral galaxies. And then you have intermediates, which are sort of in between both. And then you come over to irregular galaxies, which take up any sort of general shape, usually a mixture between some spiral structure and some globular structure. And most of these form as a result of uh, galactic mergers or galactic collisions when spiral galaxies come and collide into each other. And so um, basically two thirds of all galaxies, of all spiral galaxies that we know are barred spiral galaxies. Um, so yeah, hopefully throughout the night, as long as the clouds keep away, um, we'll give you a, a few examples of most of these different types of galaxies, the really beautiful spirals and the giant ellipticals. Thank you very much for that, Stefan. So I think the first one that um, we'll get Steve to have a chat about to start with is, uh, I am Steve, sorry, we've got to call him I am Steve, is uh, M100. So this is a live stack that was taken. It's got 17 60 second images of um, Messier 100. So Steve, if you'd like to tell us a little bit about that. So this is from uh, Anne-Marie Gamora's uh, equipment. Uh, uh, so the, this is, she's been working on this prior to the live stream so that we had something for you guys to see when we started. So this is one of the, uh, the brightest um, of the galaxies in the Virgo galaxy cluster. Um, it's a it's a fair distance away, not so. It's fifty two million light years. Oh, it's something something I'll point out actually as we go on through the evening, as we throw out these statistics, it's amazing how much difference as you look through the sort of the reference material uh, uh, for uh, ast astronomy facts. It's amazing how much variation there is um, about distances and sizes and 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 things like that. Um, and I think, uh, and that's because a lot of it is is still under research uh, as to just how far away these uh, um, objects are. So current thinking is that uh, M100 or uh, NGC 4321 as it is, is about 52 million light years away. Um, it's in Coma Berenices, which is one of the uh, constellations that for us in the southern hemisphere, only just pops its head uh, above the uh, the horizon uh, in in the east. Uh, sort of keeps a fairly low profile, um, but uh, there are uh, um, quite a few um, good objects in Coma Berenices. But as I said before, this is a face-on spiral galaxies. I think it's it's thought to be one of the sort of grand design galaxies because it really does look like a really nice spiral galaxy um it was um uh confirmed by messier in 1781 and he added it to uh, his uh, catalog as m100 so it was actually first seen by uh pierre Méchain, uh his good friend well, perhaps his good friend in uh, in the same year um and I, I think as you can see from the uh um uh the uh image here which is which is really good um that there are two prominent arms uh coming out from the core which actually spiral virtually a good halfway around uh the the, the galaxy as a whole they're, they're really fantastic arms um and um in these arms uh there are the quite significant areas of uh, intense star formation uh, and that's particularly true in the towards the centre, uh, as uh, uh, as you get towards the core. Um, there are uh, a significant number of young blue stars in there. Um, one of the things, uh, if you think back to um, Stefan's uh, uh, diagram of the different sorts of galaxies that there are, spiral galaxies tend to have uh, a lot more star forming areas. So where uh, dust and gas is uh, um, uh, being condensed into into stars. Elliptical galaxies tend to be more mature 
uh, and have less star forming areas in them. They tend to be older. Um, and in some cases, we'll see spiral galaxies actually evolving uh, into uh, elliptical galaxies, sometimes by kind of uh, combining with uh, other other galaxies as well to form larger galaxies with bigger black holes at the center. And we'll talk a little bit about those as we go through some of the uh, other objects. There's, there's a, a couple of really good uh, examples uh, uh, of those as, uh, as we go through. So we've got the antenna galaxies, which you'll see later on, assuming we've, uh, we can peer at them through the clouds where we've got two galaxies starting to come together. And then um, uh, Centaurus A, which current theories are that that's actually two galaxies that have actually combined together and completed that, that combination, or almost completed that combination. Um, Stefan. Yeah, there's, there's a couple little interesting facts that I'd like to add about this particular galaxy. So this galaxy, uh, as Steve said, is about 55 million light years, 52, 55 million light years away. And it is uh, almost a good uh, analog of what our Milky Way galaxy might look like. It's a slightly barred spiral galaxy. It's a little bit smaller than our own Milky Way galaxy with the diameter of around 100,000 light years, as opposed to the Milky Way's 150 or so thousand. Um, and this particular galaxy contains around 400 billion stars. Um, now, what you'll actually notice is that on the bottom left, towards the bottom left corner, there's another sort of cigar-shaped smudge. Now, that is uh, another galaxy, actually, uh, in around the same region, around 50 million light years away, uh, called NGC 4312. Um, and that's actually another spiral galaxy, um, but this time, this spiral galaxy is viewed edge on. So we're seeing it really as the flat disk that it really is, as opposed to the face on spiral that M100 in the center is showing to us. Um, also M M100 is, uh, it's, it's a very, very active galaxy. Like Steve said, uh, many spiral galaxies are actively forming new stars in their spiral arms as the gas and dust in those regions condenses and forms new stars. But this, this galaxy is um, actually a, a very particularly active galaxy. It's called, it's, it's got what's called an active galactic nucleus, which means that the supermassive black hole at the center of this galaxy is actually actively feeding on some of the uh, gas in that region. And it's really throwing out quite a lot of gas, uh, a lot of um, high energy radiation, which is why if you look in the center of that spiral, the center looks really, really bright compared to the rest of the, the more faint uh, spiral arms. The other thing you can notice there um, is, um, is the fuzzies, the little faint fuzzies popping around the edge there. There's yeah, yeah. I, view. Yeah, I, I was going to point that out. Those yeah. little fuzzies are actually satellite galaxies of this larger M100 galaxy. So it, it's a fact that most of the galaxies in the universe are actually dwarf galaxies, just smaller galaxies. And most of those dwarf galaxies orbit much larger galaxies like these spirals. Um, and our galaxy, the Milky Way, has its own two satellite galaxies. It's actually got around 12 satellite galaxies, but two major ones, which we call the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds. So if you're living in Australia and you've ever looked up at a really clear dark sky during summer and you see what look like two sort of small faint fuzzy clouds, those are actually satellite galaxies around our own Milky Way. Now, Steve, this one might be for you, I think. Um, Michael wants to know what shape is the Milky Way galaxy? Well, I think uh, Stefan kind of uh, uh, hinted at that earlier on. The, the Milky Way galaxy would it looks pretty similar to M100 that we're looking at uh, in the live stack here. So it's got a uh, a smallish bar and then a number of uh, uh, of significant arms coming out from the the spiral arms coming out. Um, we're um, uh, we sit in one of the, the we as in uh, the the sun. Uh, uh, 
um, and the solar system, we sit in one of the arms that's about a sort of a third of the way out uh, from the from the center in what I think is called the Orion Spur. Is that right, Stefan? Is it the Orion Spur? It's gone. That's right. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so yes. It, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can now. You're on mute. Uh, yes. We could see you. I could see you. <laughs> <your head>. uh, <laughs> just at the wrong time. So. <laughs> but yes, yes, that's right. Yeah, we're we're in an outer stretch of uh, of one of the Milky Way's arms called the Orion Spur. That's right. All right. So. Um, I think we might move to if Michael or Captain America can get the uh, image he had just up just before. We'll wait for him to do that while we keep staring at uh, Anne Marie's. It's a it's a wonderful uh, it's image. Probably, it's a beautiful life stack. It really is. Yeah. It's probably one of the best life stacks we've we've had. Uh, oh, actually, uh, Mike, yeah, we'll go to Michael's, and then I'm gonna, after we've had a look at Michael's, we're going to jump across to well, once we've had a look at Captain America's. We'll go across to Thor because Thor has um, worked his um, his lightning magic and, and got something quite beautiful on his screen. So now this was NGC. I can't remember now. Is it two double nine seven? Two double nine seven. I think it is. Is that right? Um, is that right, Michael? He's playing around in the background at the moment. I'm not sure if he can hear us. Oh. <laughs> He's yeah, I can hear yeah, yeah, no. oh, you've got Sorry to bring about the screen that. back. Where'd your I screen go? Yeah, it's fine, it's fine, no worries. There no we go. So <laughs> what, what object are we looking at here? 2997 in Two double nine seven. Beautiful. Yep, directly above us, pretty much. Uh, magnitude 10.1. Um, it's got um, lovely uh, face-on spiral galaxy. That's a textbook face-on face spiral. Uh, about nine by six um, arc minutes across. Uh, total distance probably about 38 million light years away yeah that's that's interesting uh michael there the uh the because looking at another reference source uh i'm showing 23 million light years away isn't it? it's it's fascinating it's to see the differences that there are in uh, uh in the distances and, and it's obviously as uh these different galaxies are studied and more more research is done and more analysis uh uh, you know, using redshift and stuff like that to just find out how far away these are. Uh, there's one of the objects uh, later on that we'll hopefully look at where they've sort of halved distance away in the last uh, few years, but uh, we'll come to that later. Um, so just quickly, Michael, before we move to Thor's um, gorgeous image that he's got on his screen, which is another live one, how many exposures is this one? How many stacks is this? That is a single 30-second exposure. A single 30-second exposure. <laughs> Using a Canon 6D Mark I uh, on a uh, Celestron uh, C11 Rasa, Roackerman ah. Schmidt Astrograph, F2.2. So Amazing. unfortunately, I, I haven't got the technology to, to do all this live stacking business, but I'm sure I'm sure you can teach me how. <laughs> no, it's all right. We'll get we'll get the boys to show you how they do it. But still, I mean, you've taken this tonight while we're sort of chatting around in the background, anyway. So it's still with a few others as well. So <laughs> well, we'll we'll come back to some of those others, but I think we might jump across to Thor's um, because it's it's quite a beauty. So we have Hamburger Galaxy Centaurus A. Who'd like to? Uh... I can do, uh, do a bit of an introduction uh, to it. So this is uh, one of the objects that we looked at uh, in the uh, uh, the live session that we did last Friday, uh, and this is uh, NGC five one two eight Centaurus A. Um, so um, this is uh, a bit closer. So it's uh, about twelve million light years away. Um, pretty bright, magnitude 6.6, .6, and it's in the constellation Centaurus. It's grouped with, there's three or four objects uh, in, in a very close area. Um, we'll look at one of the other galaxies, um, uh, which is which is NGC 4945, that's quite close to Centaurus A. This is also fairly close to Omega Centauri, so it's 
as the, the name suggests, it's in the constellation Centaurus. Um, so this is um, an elliptical galaxy um, with a superimposed dust line. And it's actually, remember I was saying that some galaxies have actually merged together. So it's uh, the result of, a, well, the thinking is that it's the result of a merger of, uh, of two smaller galaxies. Um, and with the elliptical galaxy devouring a spiral galaxy, uh, and the dust lines are, are really the sort of uh, resulting from that, from particularly from the spiral galaxy. Um, it's a source of uh, massive radio emissions as well from um, a supermassive black hole uh, at the centre. Um, Stefan, uh, do you want to talk a little bit more about uh, about that? I know uh, last week you did a, a very good uh, uh, explanation of some of the things going on inside uh, Centaurus Hive. Without wishing to put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, so... No, no, that's, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> yeah, so, so like, like you mentioned, Steve, this... this <laughs> yeah, so so Centaur SA is the result of a merger between two galaxies, like you said, and it's actually got some really interesting structure deep within it, uh, an interesting structure that we can't see. So many galaxies have in their core a supermassive black hole um, that are often, you know, many millions of times as heavy as a single star. So Centaurus A itself has a very active supermassive black hole. And this black hole is around 55 million solar masses, meaning it, may, it weighs as much as 55 million suns. And this is around 10 to 11 times the size of the supermassive black hole in our own galaxy. So this is a real monster. Just quickly um, there, Stefan, yes. you've, you've, you've actually touched on exactly the sort of question that somebody has asked when you're talking about black holes. And Jamie wants to know, I'm curious to know why galaxies have supermassive black holes in the centre of them and why don't we feel the pull of said black hole? So since you're talking about black holes, I'll try and give that one a, a go. Yeah, great, great question. So, yeah, so the answer to that is actually part of an ongoing debate in the uh, in the field of astronomy, and that is whether supermassive black holes seed galaxies around them, or whether the galaxies themselves give birth to the black holes. It's a bit of a what came first, the chicken or the egg sort of situation. Did the black hole come first, and the galaxy formed around it, or did all of the matter of the galaxy uh, eventually build the supermassive black hole? There's still quite a bit of debate as to which is uh, the exact case. Um, what was the second part of the question? I'm sorry. Uh, the second part was why don't we feel the pull of a black hole? Got that up. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, so why don't we feel the pull of it? Well, the fact is that we, we, we do feel the pull of the black hole. Um, but so yeah, we, we, essentially we do. All of the stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way, orbit the center of the Milky Way. It takes around, I think the number is around 250 million years for our solar system to make one trip around our galaxy, the Milky Way. And of course, the supermassive black hole, we call it Sagittarius A star, we do feel this pull of that. That is in the center of our galaxy. But its mass is uh, yeah, around 4 million solar masses, but there are many millions more, <laughs> essentially many millions more weight, uh, solar weight um, of many, many stars in between that. So yeah, compared to the rest of the mass of the galaxy, the mass of the supermassive black hole is significant, but not the majority of it. So yeah, in a way we do feel it. Steve, I know you didn't want to go down the rabbit hole, um, <laughs> but there are a lot of questions to do with black holes and, and uh, the likely and, and and similar to those popping up. And I, I have to put some of these up because they're very very interesting questions. Mm. So Lucy wants to know what's the likelihood of life similar to Earth in these galaxies. <laughs> 
I think that's a Stefan one sort of, again. A sort of one sentence. I, I, yeah, I, I, personally, I, I think it's all, it's almost certain. I would uh, agree. I, I would agree. But it, I think Stefan might have a bit more of a detailed answer than you and I. <laughs> <laughs> he has to go and explain the Drake equation. So the Drake equation. There you go. That's, you can that's explain the Drake like, equation if you'd like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or the yeah, Fermi so, paradox. So, or the Fermi is, paradox here. Yeah. <laughs> or the Fermi yeah, paradox. Yeah, so this is... This is, of yep. course, you know, one of the biggest questions of life. Are we alone in the universe? And one of the ways that astronomers and astrobiologists, people who study life in the universe, they don't have much to sample from, but they exist. The people who study this question have come up with a few different ways of thinking about it. And one way is an equation called the Fermi paradox. Um, uh, sorry, called the Drake Equation, thought up by a famous astrophysicist called Francis Drake. And this is an equation that's meant to give us some estimation of how many intelligent civilizations there are in the galaxy. And so some of the things that we need to know for this equation are how many planets there are in a galaxy. That's something that we can roughly estimate. Um, but then we need to know how many of those planets are Earth-like. That's a bit harder to determine. Then the next thing you need to know is how many of those Earth-like planets have water or conditions that may be, may be suitable to develop life. That's another unknown at the moment. And then the questions keep um, compiling. So how many of those habitable Earth-like planets could develop microbial life? How many of those microbial organisms could evolve to multicellular organisms? How many of those multicellular organisms could develop consciousness and awareness and build societies? So most of those variables, we just have no way to estimate at the moment. We don't have any data. We are only just starting to fill in some of the earlier blanks. How many planets there are in the Milky Way? How many of these planets may be Earth-like? So at the moment, we can't really make any realistic guess as to how, how often life arises and how often complex life arises. But even if life arising is a one in a billion chance, there are still trillions of planets in our Milky Way alone. So even if it's a one in a billion chance, a very, very small chance, just the sheer number of planets that are out there make that very small chance a high probability of happening. And, you know, that's in one galaxy out of trillions of galaxies. So, you know, even though we may not have the answer now and we may never know the answer, I think the likelihood that life is out there is astronomically high. Yeah. I mean, the so really, that's what you're saying. that equation is just a guesstimate, isn't it? It's absolute guesswork. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the current thing... Yeah, for the is, time being, but I mean, theoretically, yeah. we could start filling in some of the blanks. Yeah. Sorry, Steve. Go, Steve. Sorry, I, uh, I was I was butting in there. Um, just a couple of... It was a chance to throw in a couple of statistics. Uh, um, that, And again, these are probably subject to uh, uh, some uh, interrogation. Uh, there's thought to be about 200 billion galaxies in the universe, 200 billion. That number's actually come down. It, it was a bit higher than that, and then they've sort of reduced it down. Those 200 billion galaxies ver will vary in size from the small galaxies, which contain a few hundred million stars, uh, to the giant galaxies, which will contain more than a trillion stars, so a thousand billion stars. So there's a hell of a lot of noughts there. A hell of a lot of notes. Um, oh, sorry. Sorry about that. I was, I was jumping across to Captain America's because he had uh, a nice image. But, oh, hang on, it's back. There we go. I know you were talking about this one before, Steve. Oh, yes, the uh, Antenna Galaxy. Sorry, I thought we'd get off the heavy stuff and back to the galaxies. There are some more questions that we can come back to later on. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want me to do? I can do a bit of an introduction. Yeah, to if you could, that'd be great. Right. Uh, you can you can dive into a bit more detail if you like. So um, this is 
they, these two interacting galaxies, just a couple of statistics to start off with. Um, the thinking is, is that they're either 63 million light years away or possibly 45 million light years away. Um, they're not, there's different theories. So it's either 63 or 45. Um, magnitude 10 and a little bit, 10.14. So um, visible in um, a medium-sized telescope, um, uh, visual observing without the sort of camera assistance and long exposure. So these uh, objects are in, in the constellation Corvus, the crow. Uh, um, so as we sort of said, it's a pair of interacting spiral galaxies. Um, and um, as the two galaxies collide, what's happening is that the gas and dust uh, is sort of coalescing together and we're getting uh, significant areas of uh, rapid star formation. Um, the interesting thing is that this, the, uh, I don't want to worry you because this is billions of years away, but this is likely to be what will happen with between the Milky Way and the Andromeda Galaxy, which is our near big neighbour. So the Andromeda Galaxy is similar size to the Milky Way, perhaps a a little bit bigger, but similar size spiral galaxy as well. So this may be for for you know the astronomer uh, looking at uh, the Milky Way uh, and Andromeda galaxies in in a couple of billion years from you know forty five or sixty three million light years away. This may be what they'll see of our two galaxies coming together. Um, the um, so. The current thinking as well is that the two galaxies were actually separate about a billion years ago. Um, so it's, this has happened. This has happened fairly recently, within the last billion years, um, um, and within four hundred um, mil, uh, million years, the two nuclei will actually collide into a single core. Uh, and should probably then evolve into an elliptical galaxy uh, as all that star formation kind of calms down and we get a more mature galaxy. That's sort of theory at the moment. It's just just thinking. Stefan, have you? Do you want to add some more stuff? Yeah, not not too much. You pretty pretty well covered it there. That's that's uh, yeah. As you can see, there's two really beautiful galaxies that have um, basically just are caught in the process of smashing into each other. And um, if you haven't seen an image of these two galaxies before, you might not have noticed, but there are very, very faint tails coming up out of either end on the left-hand side of the image. And those are the sort of streams that have been flung to the sides, giving it the name antenna galaxies. So those streams are, you know, many millions of stars themselves being thrown out. And so like Steve mentioned, this is likely what's going to happen to our own Milky Way galaxy. It'll eventually in about 5 billion years collide with the Andromeda galaxy, the other large galaxy in our local group. And, but re in reality, this is nothing really that we would need to worry about. You might think that, you know, when galaxies collide, it's just, oh, stars hitting each other left, right and center, exploding and all of this. But in reality, the distance between the stars that make up these galaxies are so vast that it's likely that no two stars will ever even hit each other. So although the stars are being, you know, flung out into space or colliding down into a more dense uh, core, during this collision, it's likely that no stars will actually be really hitting each other. But um, so this is a sort of peak into our potential future. And it's sort of just chance at the moment whether our solar system will be a part of the stars that will be flung out into intergalactic space or whether they'll be um, sucked in towards the more dense core. And honestly, I, I don't know which, uh, which future sounds uh, more appealing, but I think it's nothing we really need to worry about. Five billion years isn't exactly around the corner. And as I mentioned last week, there's, I think there's a reasonable chance that we'll be fully out of lockdown by then. <laughs> Never say never. Very optimistic. <laughs> Someone's very optimistic. 
now um we might move to uh another what have we got trying to it's oh ah andy's uh, sorry um captain america has jumped back which one's this one what have we got here ngc this looks like m83 it's m83 it is m83 there we go so while we've been talking about that one he's been off uh, imaging another galaxy <laughs> Um, I guess I can get us started on this one. Carry so on. this is uh, this is a galaxy that we covered last uh, in our previous stream, but I'll reiterate what we said last time. So this is called the Southern Pinwheel Galaxy. And uh, the reason it's um, specified as the Southern Pinwheel Galaxy is because that name, Pinwheel Galaxy, was already taken um, um, by a galaxy up in the Northern Hemisphere. But uh, I think this one's just as pretty. So as you can see, this is another grand design spiral galaxy. It's got those really distinctive um, spiral arms spiraling out from the center. And if you look closely in the core, you'll actually notice that this is a barred spiral galaxy. So you can see um, going at a, a bit of a diagonal in the image, there's that bar leading from um, either side of the spiral arms uh, through the core. So this, this um, spiral galaxy is Again, something like our own Milky Way galaxy, a barred spiral. But this is, again, a, a bit smaller in, in size. It's about 100,000 light years in diameter, um, a little bit smaller than our own Milky Way, but, again, contains around 40 billion stars. Um, and this, uh, this spiral, uh, the Southern Pinwheel Galaxy, is actually one of the closest and brightest galaxies to us, uh, and it's a very, very active star-forming galaxy. Um, in fact, within the arms of this galaxy, we have observed 300 supernova remnants, so the corpses of long-dead exploded stars, and we've actually detected six supernovas within this one galaxy in the past 100 years. So this indicates to us that it is a very active galaxy. It's churning out many, many new, hot, large, energetic stars that are don't live for long and then explode away, um, leaving behind the more old, cool, yellowish orange stars, um, which you can see dominating the core. Steve, do you have anything to add? Um, I don't know if you, uh, it's about 15 million light years away. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's, as I think you mentioned it was uh, one of the uh, uh, close, closer galaxies to us. Um, for those of us who uh, tend to do more visual astronomy rather than astrophotography, this is one of the sort of the jewels of the of uh, the uh, southern hemisphere. Um, it's uh, it's one of the objects that's really great to look at through um, the bigger telescopes that we have at our dark sky site uh, up at Heathcote. Um, particularly obviously through our big 40 inch telescope uh, you can very clearly see the bar it, it won't it, it won't quite look as good as this uh, but nearly as good and you you can see the bar you can obviously see the bright core and you can also see some of the uh, uh, the, the spiral arms moving going out from the uh, out to the outer edges uh, uh, of the galaxy, so it's a it's a really great object to uh, uh, to look at uh, through uh, just a, um, a a normal sort of a telescope. Uh, definitely one of the showpieces of the southern sky. There we go. Now I think Thor is working on something, and he hasn't quite got anything there. I know uh, where uh, Anne-Marie is at the moment. She's got clouds, and I can hear rain hitting the roof above me in Bentley. So that's uh, that's a great sign. <laughs> Actually, we might go back to uh, Captain America. What have we got? We've got a satellite moving through there by the looks of that in that image. That is, what have we got here? We might need him. Oh, is this Leo oh, Triplet? Oh, Leo Triplet. Yeah. Look at that! Two of two of the three with the satellite sneaking no, that's through. That's the third one. There's the third one there. 
So who, who'd like to have a bit of a chat about Leo Triplett? Uh, I'll, give a bit of an, I'll give a bit of an overview. Yeah, I actually, yeah, leave, Michael, leave that uh, that shot there. That shows it really nicely. Um, so the the Leo Triplett, as it's called, for fairly obvious uh, reasons, um, the two um, galaxies that we can see at the top there um, are... Messier objects, so M65 and M66. Um, the uh, M65, they're uh, both uh, very similar sort of uh, size and distance. Uh, M65, 42 million light years away, uh, just slightly the fainter of the, the two um, Messier objects. M66, 37 million light years away. Um, it's, uh, and the, uh, is the brightest of the three. Um, the third uh, object, NGC 3628, if you want to scroll sort of down to that one. Oop, there you go. Uh, the, these are all spiral galaxies, by the way, um, is at 35 million light years away, so similar kind of a distance, uh, just over Mag 9, and that's an edge-on spiral. So people often sort of ask... Um, how come Charles Messier saw those top two but didn't see uh, the bottom one, um, the the one that just remains as an NGC object? And it's interesting that it's obvious if we go back 300 years or so, he was using a, a, a pretty basic small telescope, and it really shows that the just where um, the limit of uh, of what he could see with those telescopes with that, that telescope that he was using. So the top two he could see, but the bottom one there, NGC 3628, he wasn't able to see. Um, so just to, at that sort of limit. Um, the, um, the NGC 3628 has a quite a substantial uh, dust band, uh, which is obscuring the bright central, re you can actually see the dust band there, uh, which yeah. obscures the, uh, the, the bright, central region and the and the the star forming areas that would have uh if that dust band wasn't there then i think messi i would have easily seen that galaxy stefan yeah no you covered it pretty well i i, I don't have too much to add um other than m66 the one on the left hand side um it's what we call an intermediate spiral galaxy so you might just be able to see in the image that it doesn't have that perfect looking symmetrical spiral structure that some of the other spiral galaxies have. It's sort of a little bit warped, a little bit, um, yeah, it's a bit hard to tell. Um, but basically this is an indication that this galaxy has had quite a violent past, if you will. It, it's it's evidence that this galaxy has interacted within its past. Now, this obviously isn't a, wasn't a collision with another major galaxy like the uh, the antennae galaxies, which we saw. It may have just been a, a smaller um, dwarf galaxy that sideswiped it and it's just pulled the spiral arms apart a little bit. So, yeah, whereas um, M65 on the right, that's much more of a, a clean spiral galaxy. Um, with uh, yeah, not really a lot of evidence of uh, it being disturbed, yeah. and um, because of that, it's it's yeah. Sorry, continue. No, I was just going to say um, while we're looking at that, we've got Amory is uh, well, sorry, Gamora is uh, currently doing some stacks of um, Sombrero Galaxy, um, but uh, I just wanted to <laughs> Mike saying that makes makes me think how lucky I am when I complain about my own telescope. And Mike, as you would know, you know me, um, at least it's not a coffee grinder like mine is. Whoops. Oh, here we go. Here's a good one. Is there a limit to the distance that you or we are able to see out to in terms of galaxies? Yeah, that's a really awesome question. Do you mind if I take it, Steve? Uh, no, carry on. Absolutely. Yeah, so there, there definitely is a limit, but it sort of depends on whether you're talking about amateur equipment or professional equipment. 
obviously us amateurs with our ground-based telescopes with you know relatively small apertures and we're under an atmosphere we have a limit of what faintness we can see essentially so if a galaxy is more than i think magnitude 22 or something then that's on the sort of edge of what we can detect with um with our amateur equipment but obviously professional astronomers with much more sophisticated equipment uh their limitations are, are, are much less but there is a physical limitation not related to our equipment but related to the physics of the universe, there is a limit as to how far we can see. And this is called the, the border of the observable universe. So this is a, a really interesting point that we maybe should have brought up before, but the further you look out in space, the further back in time you're looking. Because essentially light has a limit. It has a speed limit, the speed of light, right? So when we look, say, one light year at an object that's one light year away, the light that we're seeing from that object took a year to get to us. These galaxies that we're looking at, some of them are 50 million light years away. So when the light left those galaxies, that was 50 million years ago. Now, we know that the universe itself has an age limit. The universe is only around 13.8 billion, year, billion years old. So as we start looking further and further away into space, billions of light years away, we're looking further and further back in time. And eventually we hit a sort of, um, a sort of limit called uh, the cosmic microwave background where we're looking so far back in time that we're essentially seeing the early stages of the universe. Um, and yeah, I hope that answers your question. I think that's a, a very good answer. We've got, um, oh, hang on a second. Ah, Gamora is good to go. You'll have to share your screen with me again, Anne-Marie, because we've uh, it's dropped off for some reason. But Anne-Marie has the Sombrero Galaxy. She's uh, put together some stacks. So once she shares the screen, we'll, we'll pop that one on. Uh, at the moment, Drax is um, trying to move very slowly to avoid the rain where he is. It's uh, nothing but rain out in Ringwood. And here we go. So this is Sombrero Galaxy live from, wow, <laughs> that is three 60-second stacks. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, I'm not often left speechless with live stacking, but that is just unbelievable. We've, we've never had live stacking that good before. <laughs> That is just absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Emery, can we make that screen a little bit bigger at all? The one that the image is on, is that possible? Can we like zoom in a little bit or, cause that's just, oh. That's, that live stack is better than some people, some of the astrophotographers do spending hours and processing. <laughs> That's how good that is. That's just absolutely amazing. Um, well, Steve, you can um, take over because. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. So this is this is another of the uh, the showpiece uh, objects. Uh, this is a great object uh, again to look at uh, just visually through through an eyepiece, uh, through a telescope, vi visible very easily in a in a six or an eight inch uh, Dobsonian telescope. Um, I have a, a 10 inch uh, Dobsonian, it, it looks great. On, on a really good clear night, uh, you can see that dust uh, lying uh, in, uh, uh, visually through a 10 inch telescope, it's, uh, it's great. And obviously through the bigger scopes that we have um, at uh, um, our dark site, uh, it's very, very obvious. So uh, this is M104, another Messier object, the Sombrero Galaxy. Uh, looks like a Sombrero hat, obviously. Um, it's um, about 28 million light years away, so magnitude 8. So uh, quite a bright galaxy, and it's uh, in Virgo. 
So it's fairly close to, it's on the edge of Virgo, fairly close to uh, Corvus the Crow. I normally star hop to M104 from one of the brighter stars in Corvus uh, 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 when I'm looking at it visually. Um, so it, it appears, when you look at it there, it appears to be an edge-on spiral galaxy with a prominent dust lane, but it's now thought to be an elliptical galaxy with a thin embedded disk galaxy in it as a, 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 a spiral galaxy. So I think we would call that uh, a lenticular galaxy. Um, uh, Stefan may talk, go back and talk about this a little bit more using that uh, Hubble uh, diagram that he showed uh, earlier on. Uh, the thinking is it's about 50,000 light years across. So it's not a very big galaxy. Um, but it, uh, one of the little features of it is it has a huge number of globular clusters uh, in it, somewhere between 1,200 and 2,000. Stefan? Just before Stefan yeah, jumps so in, just before you jump in, Stefan, we have a very, very good question, um, and we probably should have explained a little bit about this um, before. But Mark Penny wants to know, has live stacking been explained for us newbies? So I don't know, Stefan, whether you'd be able to explain live stacking. I'll probably get it wrong. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if you can explain what the guys are doing. I mean, essentially, really, they're just using their gear and their, their astronomy gear and um, a program that is layering images over image over image, and they're taking certain length exposures and they're stacking on top of each other? Yeah, that's, that's basically the gist of it. So for anyone in the audience who's not an astrophotographer, the way that we generate really beautiful images is that we need to take lots of shorter images and then average them all together. And doing this brings down the noise and it makes a much more contrasty, bright, colorful um, image. And so live stacking, which is what we're doing now, is basically just taking a lot of short exposures, a lot of short photos, and just our program is just adding them up and up and up and up. Um, yeah, it's it's just what we would do when we're trying to make a full photo. But usually to make a, a full photo, we will stack, you know, three, five, ten hours worth of photos together, whereas here we're just doing a, a few minutes. Um, so I think, you know, this can really attest to the high quality of current um, astrophotography gear, the fact that you can get an image of this, uh, you know, a galaxy 30 or 10, 20 million light years away in just a few minutes on your computer. It's pretty pretty amazing when you think about it. So this is six six images so far, and it's uh, each image, I think, from memory, Anne-Marie was saying that she was doing 60-second exposure. So this is six minutes of exposures of the Sombrero Galaxy. Uh, and we do have a question that Anne-Marie can jump in and, and answer. Caleb wants to know, what gear is this on M104 right now? So Anne-Marie, what, what equipment are you using to take these images for us? Uh, I've got a reflector. It's a 250, 1200 millimeter um, focal length. And I'm using a ZWO as a 1600 mm um, camera. And that, so that's all hooked up, hooked together to the camera, and you're just doing 60-second exposures at the moment? Yeah. What's yeah. The, if, you were to, if you were to do M104 and process mm -hmm. it properly and do a proper run on it, how many hours would you normally take of this, of this object? Probably only a couple of hours. Um, but because I've got a mono camera, I'd have to take um, these ones, the loom, and, as well as red, green, and blue. And then I'd have to so, process each one and then stack them all together. Yep. To get a so there's, mm. so there's hours upon hours of work to get the final finished product. And what we're seeing here is now while well, seven yeah. minutes. I spend more exposure. time. Yeah. I don't spend as much time on galaxies as what I do on nebulas. Uh, nebulas, you can spend like 10, 20 hours. But these galaxies, I don't spend so much time. Because the, the, the loom in the red, green and blue, um, you don't have to expose for quite so long. So you can, you can sort of get a decent exposure. And with my scope, I can get good shots without having to spend too much time on them. Same with the RASA. Somebody else said they had, had a RASA. Yeah, that Very was Captain fast. America's. Mm. Captain America's got his RASA. 
Uh, we've yeah. got another quick question, Amory, that you might be able to answer, and I'm assuming it's to do with the stars. Um, what causes the telescope, telescope astigmatism and is the effect deliberate? Do you mean these star spikes? I'd say so, yeah. Um, that's because of the reflector because I have, um, oh, somebody else help me out here. <laughs> I'm not technical. Um, I, have to a secondary I can mirror. explain if you like. Yeah. yeah, the thing that holds a secondary, secondary mirror. <laughs> There we go. Somebody else explain that. <laughs> yeah, there's a cross in the middle of the uh, scope which holds the secondary mirror in place. And that causes so that those. Just causes those. Yeah. See, Drax is moving so quickly that he was able to jump in and answer that question. Thank you. <laughs> I'm worried that. You I'm asked that question about three hours ago, wasn't it? Yeah, you did. I asked that three hours ago, Drax. It took you that long to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Anne-Marie, what, what mount are you using? Uh, I've got an e a Skywatcher EQ6R. Oh, okay. For this, yeah, this one. Now, um, we've got a very, very interesting question, and um, the person who's asked it will know what my answer will be. Uh, mm. And I'll, I don't know how many of you people of you, of you here who are streaming with us in the team here. Um, I know Andy hasn't seen through the 40-inch I know. I don't know if Michael's seen through it or not. I don't know if I um, my Anne Marie hasn't. So really, Steve, uh, essentially, this will probably be one for you and me and maybe Lee, possibly yeah. Rockets. I don't know if Rockets seen through the forty inch, but uh, Neil's dad, um, Ken, who is a wonderful man, Ken's a, a legend, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, wants to know what our favourite galaxy to look at through the 40-inch. And Ken, uh, mine, mine's not actually a galaxy. My favourite object is uh, uh, Ghost of Jupiter. But if we're talking about galaxies, um, it, it's Hamburger for me. Hamburger Galaxy through the 40-inch is absolutely stunning. What about you, Steve? I, I think this one takes some beating, M104. Uh, M83 that we had a look at earlier on as well is is a real showpiece uh, as well. The, it fills, one of the, fills the eyepiece, doesn't it? In one, yeah, uh, in one of the challenges with the 40 inch is that because uh, um, it's got a very long focal length, the the field of view uh, through the telescope is is fairly narrow compared with a smaller Dobsonian telescope. So something like uh, the Leo triplet, which I can get all three objects in the same field of view uh, uh, in my 10 or 12 inch uh, uh, Dobsonian telescope, you can only get one of the three galaxies in the field of view of the big 40 inch. It's just the, the way it works. It's the way the optics are. I don't know, Lee. Have you seen anything through the forty-inch galaxy-wise? Yeah, look, similar, similarly, the um, M one hundred four. I've uh, I, I'm probably one of the favourite as far as galaxies go. But I actually quite look at looking at the um, Omega cluster, um, and I think it really galaxy, sort of pushes though, so you the uh, averted see. vision to try it's and see a, stuff it's in not it. Not a galaxy, so you're not I allowed know, to see. I know, but I know, but <laughs> but but but. It's, it's got to be one of all It's the only one I've seen. The <laughs> first galaxy to look at through the 40 inch uh, on, on a number of accounts is actually the Andromeda galaxy. And the reason <laughs> being is one, well, you can't actually see it because you can't bring the telescope, the 40 inch telescope, low enough to the to the northern horizon. And there are trees in the way. The, there are trees in the way, but also because the Andromeda galaxy is not really a good telescope object. It's too big for a telescope. It's much better in uh, binoculars uh, or even through uh, through the finder scope uh, on, a, on a telescope, which is a sort of like half a pair of binoculars, if you like. So uh, I often get uh, people up at the dark side all say, oh, can we, can we look at the Andromeda galaxy? And I go, no, oh, you're not going to like it. Yeah, you're not going to like it, no. Um, for those of you who don't know what the 40-inch is that we're talking about, that's the ASV's um, prize possession. The, the, it's a 40-inch it's a um, obsession, is it, Steve, or is it ED? Uh, um, I can't think of the, the initials of the uh, manufacturer. Hubble um, Optics. Yep. Well, Hubble Optics provided the mirror. So the mirror, mirror 
was right. found uh, in uh, Hong Kong uh, and then shipped over. It took a long, long time for it to come. Um, and uh, it's a special sort of um, laminated mirror. It's not a solid piece of glass. It has um, a sort of waffle structure in the middle. Uh, and then uh, it's sandwiched, uh, the waffle has, there's obviously a layer at the back and then the, the, the ground uh, um, um, mirror on the, the, on the top surface, which does all the work. Oh, look at this. You haven't got to add this. Here we go. Oh, 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 no, I've got to add him back. Hang on a second. We're going to solo lay out Drax. Drax has bought up the 40 inch. So for those of you, yeah, it's an SDM I'm being told SDM, by. SDM, yeah. yeah. EDM, SDM. Oh, it's all French to me. Um, all I know is it's a bloody big telescope. Um, it's beautiful to use. Uh, it's the, the, the big brother to the 25 inch that we've got up there. Um, and for those paying attention in the background of that photo, if you zoom back out again, Lee, you can see our deep sky section director's van in the background. <laughs> <laughs> All set up. It sits within uh, our roll-off roof uh, observatory. The, that's the that, that the, the roof rolls all the way across uh, um, to cover the telescopes over. Um, in in that observatory, we have the forty-inch telescope. We have an eighteen-inch telescope. No, no, we don't have an eighteen-inch anymore. Well, it, it's there some of the time. It does go. <laughs> Doesn't it? As, uh, it's as on tour three. at the moment, yes. Um, um, we have a, a 12 inch Dobsonian, we have uh, is it a 10 inch um, Mage Mitt yes. uh, We've got a whole bunch of telescopes in there. So the 40 inch refers to the size of the mirror as well. So the mirror is a 40 inch mirror. The, it, in interestingly, fact, you can see the secondary mirror there at the in, in the top just below the spider vein, which is that cross that we were talking about that causes those yeah. uh, uh, those um, uh, the stars to do the sort of cross on them uh, that secondary uh, mirror I think is bigger than the mirror in my 10 inch telescope <laughs> it's a pretty big secondary it's, it's absolutely <laughs> huge <laughs> it is it really is so that's if you're an ASB member um, you actually can be trained to use that telescope so there's, there's some incentive to become a member of the society if you're not already a member. Uh, you can learn to roll that roof off and then learn to use that telescope so that if you go up to that site and there's nobody up there who knows how to use it and you're there and you do know how to use it, you can use it. Um, but you do have to go through a training process, which is pretty straightforward. Oh, there's Drax. He's back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a very good incentive. Oh, is this tweezers? It looks like it. It is. There we go. We've just jumped to the next object. Yep. Like I've got that too. <laughs> oh, have you got a live stack of that? Have you, Thor? Yes, it's it's a it's all right. It's a um a bit small, but um I'll just see if it brighten up a little bit. I might. What I might do is jump between these two views. Whoop. So we've got um, Captain America's view of tweezers that he's been imaging. And then we've got Thor's version that he's been live stacking right now. How many images is a, that? That's just a single 30-second uh, one. So they just, they're just single 30 second of tweezers. So Steve, yeah. um, oh, sorry, I am Steve and Rocket. If you've uh, got anything you'd like to say about Tweezers, I'm just going to jump between Captain America and Thor's screen. They can battle between each other. They can both lift each other's hammers, so that's the good thing. So when we were talking about um, Centaurus A, and I mentioned uh, that there's a group of, uh, of uh, really great objects uh, in, in a similar part of the sky. This is one of the other galaxies. Uh, uh, so uh, in, a tele in a visual telescope, this is a huge object. It fills the field of view. Um, uh, and, and the reason it's huge is it's not that it's a particularly huge galaxy. It's actually just very close. So it's uh, thir about 13 million light years away. So similar sort of distance to Centaurus A. Um, 
it's a it's an edge on spiral galaxy as you as you can see there um, and it's um the second brightest uh, galaxy in that group so centaurus a is a little bit brighter but not very much uh brighter um uh stefan do you want to add some more detail or? Yeah, uh, so this is kind of one of those examples of galaxies where there just isn't that much information. Um, I, I did a bit of searching, but yeah, really, I, I couldn't find anything particular about this galaxy. But if we go back to the, the wider field of view, I'm not sure it's whose it's live it's stack that was. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly what I was going to point out. So that's NGC 4976. So it's uh, another galaxy, but um, it's about 40 million light years away. Um, you can see it's it's it appears close to the Tweezers galaxy, but um, I, I don't believe that they're actually interacting. So it's not that. NGC 4976 is a satellite. Um, so this this galaxy, NGC 4976, is what we call a peculiar elliptical galaxy. So um, it's either undergone some interaction in its uh, in its past, or it's got an active galactic nucleus, uh, which is quite interesting because it's it's a relatively small galaxy. Um, just one final interesting fact about this one is this galaxy here was actually discovered by an amateur. Uh, astronomer, um, I forgot to write down his name, but he he discovered this with a just a five inch reflecting scope. So um, while hunting for comets, so uh, yeah, if you think that uh, amateurs don't have anything to contribute, you, you'd be dead wrong. Um, it's it's not too uncommon that we find uh, new, very faint, far off galaxies or very faint planetary nebulae, stuff like that. You can see those. Uh those huge uh, areas of uh, of dust uh, and gas uh, uh, over on the sort of lower left of the galaxy. There, um, this is one of the object, one of the few galaxies uh, where you can see when you look at it visually through a through you know a similar telescope to what I have, a ten or a twelve inch telescope. You can see a, a quite a bit of detail, quite a bit of granularity. Some of that that detail of the uh, uh, of the the dust and and the gas. It's a really great object to look at um, vis visually. So I think we might jump to Anne, Anne Marie's got. Um, sorry, I've got to use the proper names. Gamora has got <laughs> NGC four eight eight nine. She's done some um, some images of there. And wow, there's like how many were there? One, two, three, four, five, six, <laughs> seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. <laughs> wow, there's over twenty galaxies in this in this field of view. <laughs> well over twenty galaxies. Which one NGC uh, four eight eight nine is? I'm assuming it's the the the, the central one. The bright central one there but there are so many other little faint fuzzies in there yeah it's dead center yeah it's so right. it is the one right in the middle yep and then so, surrounding it is a, a heck of a lot of other galaxies yeah this is um we were talking about sort of distances so i think this is the <laughs> the galaxy that that is the furthest away that we'll be viewing this evening it so, is yes uh it's uh it, this is the fascinating thing with uh, with with these objects is we we look at this and we think well that's not so good is it oh it's just a bit of a fuzzy blob but it's an, a mass it's a super giant elliptical galaxy that's 330 million light years away uh quite 330 away. million light years away that one in the center uh, so that the light that we are seeing from that galaxy set off before there were dinosaurs on the planet here. Before there were dinosaurs on the planet. I think. That's, yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Before there were dinosaurs, yes. I, I certainly haven't arrived on the planet. I don't know. So, some, say, some say that that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> So 
So I'll leave that, this, one. I'll leave that one alone. Stefan, it's all yours. Yeah, this is actually, it, it, it may not visually look like much. These elliptical galaxies tend to be, you know, just sort of amorphous blobs of stars. Not much to look at compared to the spiral galaxies. But oftentimes, these are the more interesting galaxies, actually, in terms of their history. So NGC 4889, the major one of these uh, galaxies, is, as we said, an elliptical galaxy. And most of these elliptical galaxies have come about because a number of different galaxies have all collided together and merged together in this giant, super giant galaxy. And this really is an incredibly large galaxy. Our Milky Way is around 150,000 light years in diameter. This is about 1.3 million light years in diameter. So almost 10 times the size of our own Milky Way galaxy. And it contains some 8 to 15 trillion solar masses. So this is an absolute monster of a galaxy. Um, so a lot of elliptical galaxies like this, because of um, all of the interaction and collision that they've gone through, they lose a lot of their um, a lot of the gas and dust that tends to build up in galaxies, and so a lot of these elliptical galaxies are essentially they've undergone all of their star formation, and they're really just the older stars that are just sort of petering out, and there's not a lot of new stars being formed within them. So you can really think of them as sort of these giant, old, mature, slowly dying galaxies. But that's not to say that they're they're inactive. Um, uh, NGC 4889 actually has a really incredibly large supermassive black hole at its center. Um, this supermassive black hole is around 5,000 times larger than our own supermassive black hole. It contains some 20 billion solar masses. This is one of the largest supermassive black holes that we have on record. Um, to give you some idea, the event horizon, so the the you can imagine it like the the largest extent of this black hole stretches beyond the orbit of Pluto. So this black hole could suck down our entire solar system like nothing. So this really is a monster in the universe. Unreal. I didn't realize it was that big. 5,000 times the size of ours. <laughs> and knowing how big the one in our, our, our Milky Way is compared to our sun. Yeah, I, I mean, it's called a supermassive black hole, but this thing is just a, a super. mega giant. Oh, my God, mega there's no words for it. Hole. We've got a couple of, a couple of questions here. Um, Neil's back again. Uh, wants to know where the telescopes we're seeing through tonight are located. Um, all right, Neil, Drax the Destroyer is in Ringwood. He hasn't popped anything up yet because it's raining on him at the moment. You are not um, seeing through my telescope. No, we're not seeing through his telescope either. Uh, he's moving so slow that, that slowly that we actually can't see anything move. Uh, Captain America is coming to us from Swan Hill. He's uh, on a break at the moment up in Swan Hill. Gamora is uh, out in behind Molden. Where's, where, where is it called again? Karangawa. Karen Are you just south Karen of Gower? Karen Gower? Uh, about 40 minutes from Bendigo. 40 minutes from Bendigo towards the west. Uh, no, south of. South and we're about 30, 30 minutes from Maryborough and 20 minutes from Castlemaine. There we're in the middle. So <laughs> yep, you're in the middle there. I reckon I've driven through it once. Uh, and Thor is coming from Asgard. <laughs> <laughs> he may as well be anyway. He's out near the west at the uh, South Australian border. Um, probably, I think, I think Andy, you're about six kilometres from the South Australian border. I remember you telling me. Yep, that's about right. Yep, there we go. <laughs> so he really is from Asgard. That's that's how far away he is. So we, we've got telescopes covering at the moment the, well, from Ringwood where it's raining all the way across the uh, east coast of Victoria at the moment. Um, and thankfully, on <laughs> the east coast, the, sorry, the western side of Victoria, and thankfully, at the moment, the western side of Victoria has got no clouds. No um, cloud. At the moment. At the moment. Yes. Now, I've got an image of three galaxies, which are pretty yes. close to us. Yes. Um, we thought we'd pop this up. one up. 
Yep. So, Steve, I am Steve and Rocket. You can uh, have a chat about that. But while you do, have a think about this question from Jamie wanting to know which is the largest galaxy that we know of currently. So let's talk about what we can see on the screen first and then we can come back to this question. Well, I think we're looking at the Magellanic Clouds there. Yep. The large and small magic clouds, yep. So as the name sort of hints at, the larger of the two is the large Magellanic Cloud and the smaller of the two is the small Magellanic Cloud. So these are these are two um, uh, irregular galaxies. So remember, we were talking about. I think I, Stefan. I think they're treated as irregulars, aren't they? Uh, I think they are. Yes, yes, that's right. Um, so they don't have any any uh, strong structure about them. Um, but um, these sit just off to the edge of the Milky Way. There are. Uh, nearly the, the nearest neighbours to the Milky Way. Um, the uh, uh, the large Magellanic Cloud is about 160,000 light years uh, away from us. Um, the small Magellanic Cloud, I, I think, is 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 similar, perhaps a little bit further away. I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, I'm sort of winging this one because I haven't sort of prepared any notes on it, but uh, we'll see how we go. Um, the the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is uh, uh, has some ma some huge areas of, of star forming uh, uh, within it. Uh, uh, there's a wonderful nebula called the Tarantula Nebula, um, which uh, and there it is. Uh, um, when you zoomed in there, um, uh, um, so the the tarantula. Um, oh, it's oh, I'm flicking around a little bit. But, um, so the, the the that's the is that the small the 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 um, the, the, the tarantula nebula uh, is an um, it's a massive area of nebulosity. Um, it's a long way away, obviously 160,000 light years away. If it were the same distance as the Orion Nebula, which is, um, I think, about 1,200 light years away, um, uh, if it were that close to us, uh, it would cast shadows in the night sky. It would be so bright. Um, and a uh, wonderful object to, to look at through a visual telescope. That, that's the Tarantula Nebula. Um, but uh, sits within uh, the, the Large Magellanic Cloud, as I say, has these large areas of, uh, uh, of uh, star-forming nebulosity, if you like. Um, wonderful area to look at. There's so much stuff in there. Stefan. <laughs> yeah, so so the other question that we had was what is the largest galaxy that's out there? And that's a good question. We we don't know every single galaxy that's out there, but the largest galaxy that we're aware of is uh, catalogued as IC1101. Um, so that's another catalog designation called the index catalog. But this, this galaxy is another one of those super giant elliptical galaxies. So another one of those big blobby galaxies that's formed from the merging of um, probably many dozens of galaxies over its lifetime. And this galaxy, IC1101, it's uh, located in the constellation Virgo, and it's around uh, 2 million uh, light years in, um, in radius, I think that's... Yeah, so about 4 million light years in diameter, this thing. So this galaxy alone would stretch the distance from our Milky Way galaxy to the Andromeda galaxy twice. So this is really an incredible monster, a beast of a galaxy. Uh, it's estimated to contain about 10 trillion stars. So, yeah, that's... Uh, very, very interesting. We have a, another couple of galaxies here that uh, Captain America is just throwing up, and I'm not sure what they are. Is it NGC 5078? Is that right? Yeah, it looks like it is. Not sure if it's on our list of options. <laughs> <laughs> He's testing us. He's testing he us. Is. He's 
Michael was just like throwing stuff up randomly for fun, I think, just to really, really, really. What was that? NGC. NGC 5078. 5078. While you guys are uh, researching that one so we can um, pretend we know what we're talking about, <laughs> we'll bring up we'll bring up Anne Marie's M87 and you can have a chat uh, about that one now. Yeah. And, uh, Steve, so, you, you have a look at – you look up NGC – I can't remember what it was now. We'll go to 5078. And, Robert, you can tell us about uh, Messier – 87 m87 yeah there. And there's some more fuzzies around that one too yeah there is so so this this is actually one that um I, I i'm certain all of us know at least one fact about and this is because m87 is the host galaxy of the supermassive black hole that was recently imaged back a couple of years ago by the event horizon telescope this was the first image of a black hole that was ever created and that's the supermassive black hole that's in the core of this galaxy, M87. So M87 itself is another one of these supermassive uh, elliptical galaxies. Again, the result of uh, many, many different galaxies all merging together. And, um, and yeah, so it, it's, it's a basically just an enormous sphere of, uh, of stars. Let's... Uh, I can't really find how many stars it's estimated, but my guess is on the order of uh, almost a trillion stars within this galaxy. And, um, yep, so oh, there's a... Yeah. yeah, so, and like, like I said, so there's a supermassive black hole in the core of this galaxy, um, and the supermassive black hole in the core of this galaxy is around 4 billion solar masses, so that's about a thousand times as large as our own supermassive black hole. Um, and just by happenstance, so the, the the first image of a black hole that was ever created by the Event Horizon Telescope project, um, they were trying to create two, uh, or they had two candidate supermassive black holes that they were considering imaging, either our own uh, Sagittarius A star in our own Milky Way galaxy, or the supermassive black hole in uh, M87 here. And because e even though this black hole in M87 is so much further away, it's so much larger that it appears about the same size. So um, they they selected this one as uh, their first image. But if, if you're not aware of uh, this project, I'm sure you've at least seen the photo of the first black hole image ever taken. But uh, to take that image, they essentially used observatories all over the telescope to act as uh, one basically Earth-sized telescope. So here you can see it um, on the screen. So what you're seeing, basically that dark patch in the middle, this is near the uh, event horizon. Um, you can see this, this sort of darkening where a lot of the light even is being sucked into the event horizon. Um, and all of that glow around the edge, that's very, very high energy radiation that's being emitted, I believe in X-ray. I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it was X-ray. But basically, as gas and dust fall into the black hole, it um, it orbits the, the event horizon extremely quickly, and the friction from the gas rubbing against itself um, superheats that gas and it re-emits um, electromagnetic radiation at very, very high frequencies, very, very high energy. Um, and that this galaxy there, that is the host of that supermassive black hole. Um, and well, can you put the black hole back up again, Drax? There we go. So Jamie has uh, said it perfectly. It is the forbidden donut. <laughs> Don't want to go near that donut. You'll get spaghettified. I like donuts. <laughs> Homer likes donuts as well. So, so M87. Now, are you, uh, Steve, have you got um, some info now on uh, MGC 5078? Go, go to 5078 and we'll... And 5010 as well. Which is... Uh... So which is which is five oh seven eight? Oh come on, you're meant to know. You should be the you're the expert. 
thank you, thank you. Uh, five and a half. said about that. Yeah. There's another. There's interestingly, there's uh, there's another galaxy, the other side of five one oh one, which is five oh six one, as well. Uh, but we can't. It's a bit yeah, lower down. Actually. There we go. Yep, yep. Um, the uh, just uh, just some basic info. There's not a huge amount. There of it is there. There's five oh six one there, right on the screen now. Oh, there we are. So five oh seven eight. Um, is quite a long way away, 100 million light years, apparently. Uh, it's in Hydra. Uh, and uh, uh, magnitude, for those who are interested, magnitude well, nearly 11, 10.91. Um, one of the things you can see is it's got a really good dust line that's uh, visible um, in there. Uh, I don't have any information about that where I'm in the reference uh, material that I'm looking up. Um, just, just basic. Okay. Um, Rocket, you got anything to add to that? Yeah. So, um, on the other galaxy, not, uh, 5078, <laughs> that one there, yeah, 5101. That's the more interesting one I think we've, uh, we've Throwing out out. professionalism <laughs> here at the moment, aren't we? <laughs> Um, What's the word for it? Amateur? We are amateur astronomers. Really, exactly. We, exactly. Are, we are simply volunteers who love doing <laughs> what we do. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, you can see on the screen right now, um, that was a good representation of, uh, of, of this, this galaxy. So it's, it's what's called a lenticular galaxy. So it's not quite a spiral galaxy. It has some spiral structure, but um, it's, it's, Overall morphology is is more sort of globular, um, and lenticular. The the origin of that word is the word lens because it's sort of lens shaped, almost football shaped. But we're seeing it sort of more face on, so we get a bit of uh, an indication of some spiral structure. But um, this this galaxy in the image that we're seeing in the live stack, you can see really the core, the sort of bright core. But um, if we go back to that, uh, the previous image, um, if we can get that up, where we can see the sort of outer spiral arms as well. I'm not sure who had that up. Yeah, yeah, there we go. So that really bright core, that's what we're able to pick up in the live stack. But you can see that surrounding that, there's this sort of outer circle, this halo, another sort of um, shell, another ring of, um, of uh, spiral arm. And this is really an indication that this this galaxy has had some interaction in its past that's disturbed it in some particular way. Um, other than that, it's a similar size to our own Milky Way, around 120, 130,000 light years in diameter. But uh, yeah, not, not too much else that I could find, unfortunately. I think we're now sort of sitting and waiting for some of our guys to see if they can get some other um, objects up for us to look at. So um, we did have a question, which while we're waiting, you might be able to answer, Stefan. Um, would a black hole work like a tornado or like water spinning it down a drain? And I guess it depends if, you, if you're in the northern or southern hemisphere as to which way it spins. <laughs> um, yeah, so... so it's interesting that's it's an analogy that's often given is that a black hole is sort of like a a drain but really black holes don't suck right they don't produce any suction force they're just what's what's another way to think about it it's like pulling yeah it's it's like a hill if you imagine a hill that is continuously going down, but that angle is becoming steeper and steeper and steeper. There's no, the, the, that hill isn't sucking you in, but if you put a ball on there, that ball is going to keep rolling down and down and down and down faster and faster and faster. So, um, but yes, it's absolutely true that the closer you get to a black hole, if you don't have enough, um, enough velocity to, basically stay in orbit around that black hole, you will eventually start falling into it. And um, 
yeah, nothing good will come of that. If you haven't heard of it, uh, <laughs> if you fall into a black hole, you will be what's called spaghettified. You will be turned into spaghetti. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so basically, that's a result of the the tidal forces. Um, so the force of gravity at your feet will be higher than the force of gravity at your head. And so your feet will start being pulled away further and faster than your head and you'll be stretched out as, you know, as thin as a piece of spaghetti, essentially. But um, one, one interesting thing about that is that the larger a black hole is, the lower the tidal force that you, ex that you experience um, when you get closer to it. So some of these supermassive black holes that we've been talking about, you can easily fall into the event horizon of that black hole without being spaghettified, um, just because the black hole itself is so large that the tidal force, the difference in force between your legs and your head is small enough that you can fall in in one piece. So, yeah, bit of a tangent, but I don't recommend falling into black holes. <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna do that next weekend, but now you've you spoiled it. Uh, so we have the Eyes Galaxy up at the moment. So I am Steve Rocket. Uh, go nuts on this one. Following this, about uh, Anne Marie's working on. Um, I believe she's working on M eighty six, and then. Uh, we might close it out. Michael wanted to close out our night with a uh, a comet because Michael is a comet man. So Captain America is a comet man. So we'll have a look at eyes. We'll jump across to uh, M eighty six, and then we'll finish with a comet. I've st we've stumped them with eyes. They're yeah, I'm just, um, huh? I'm just going. The, we we had a we sort of had a look at the so the eyes galaxies are in Markarian's chain, uh, in uh, Virgo, um, and uh, I'm I'm just talking off the top of my head here because this is not one that we kind of prepared. We're having to sort of just find objects that we can see through the clouds. Um, just. Uh, um, Stefan, I don't know whether you can uh, cover for me while I just uh, home in on it in my uh, star chart here and pick up a few more facts. Yeah, sure. I'll just bring up my uh, my notes Sorry. from last time about I'm, this. I'm so, need to know stuff off I'm the top of the head, guys, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Let me consult my memory, okay? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Your Google memory? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so the eyes galaxy. Um, can we increase the brightness in the image a little bit, just so I can uh, try yeah, and get my bearings as to which ones we're looking at? Or and brighten it up a bit. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I'm s okay, okay. So yeah, so so the eyes galaxy. Um, it's actually a pair of galaxies, um, and these these galaxies are interacting. So. They're slowly coming together. Um, they're not not um, very far through their interaction, but um, uh, over the next million years, they'll they'll continue falling through each other and then eventually fall back and keep going in this sort of oscillatory motion and um, eventually merge into one uh, one much larger galaxy. But um, on top of that. Uh, I believe they're about 52 million light years away and they form, like Steve said, part of the Markarians chain, which is a cluster of uh, around seven galaxies in the constellation Virgo, obviously, um, named after uh, a Romanian, no, sorry, an Armenian um, astronomer, Benjamin don't Markarian, get, who discovered them. Wrong. Yeah, yikes. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I get those wrong. <laughs> Um, yeah, so 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 Benjamin Makarian, he he discovered that all seven of these, or more than seven of these galaxies, all shared a common motion, and so they must be um, gravitationally linked somehow. Um, and yeah, there's not a lot more I've got on this one, unfortunately. But yeah, I think we might jump across to uh, M83 unless you've got something to add. I am Steve. No, I think that's uh, let's let's hop across. 
I think. Uh, to M, back to M83. We did do M83. It's not M83. Why did I say M83? M86. Sorry, guys. M86. I can see a look of bemusement on your face in the background. <laughs> uh, um, Steve, do you have uh, something on this? I've got a little bit I could say, but... Carrie, I've... I've uh... So these are again. These are in. Uh, these are on the sort of uh, edge of Mark Air. So M eighty six is the fuzzy uh, one be... down towards the bottom, I believe. So that, that, that's actually a really a better view of the eyes galaxies there because you can see the interaction <laughs> of uh, the two galaxies with the the sort of streaming coming from the galaxy on the left and sort of heading over towards the the right that's hand. The, whoop, whoop. Yeah, in the top corner. Yeah. So that I think that's a better that's a much better view of the eyes galaxies. Um, so at one end of Markarian's chain is uh, M84, which is um, a an elliptical lenticular galaxy. Uh, M86 uh, is kind of forms like a pair uh, with uh, with M84, and I think uh, M86 is the uh, the large galaxy at the bottom of the uh, picture. Yeah, the big, the big, the big phase, fuzzy looking one. Yeah, the big fuzzy yep. one. There he is there, big bright bugger. So these are uh, M86 is about 50, 57 million light years away. Um, uh, the, um, oh, sorry, just go back to that. Um, and uh, it's uh, pretty bright, magnitude 8.8. .8. So obviously, this was one of the objects that was that was bright bright enough for uh, um, good old Charles Messier to uh, to see through his limited uh, um, optical uh, facilities that he had or through telescopes that he had available to him back in the. Uh, 18th century, um, he would not have been able to see those other galaxies that sit around. In fact, he didn't see the eyes galaxies above there, which seem nearly as bright, but through um, a, in, a, a visual telescope, just where you, you know, you're looking through an eyepiece, um, M86 at the bottom there is a lot brighter than the eyes galaxies uh, above. Uh, we've sort of made, almost made the eyes galaxies kind of falsely bright uh, because of the way that we're uh, catching the light with the live stack. Um, I don't know, is that as, that's the full image there, isn't it? We, it if is, we went yeah. a little bit lower down, we would be able to see um, M84 as well, which is a similar sort of object to M86. So uh, um, a, um, uh, a, an elliptical uh, lenticular galaxy. Uh, I, I think um, Captain America was going to show us a, a, a comet. He's moved to, looks to me like he's moved to a little bit of Markarians, but uh, here we go. So while Michael gets his comet going, I just wanted to thank all the, the, the team tonight, Drax, Thor, Gamora, Captain America, I am Steve, Rocket, and myself, Star-Lord, for putting our time aside to do this stream. Um, also wanted to let those of you watching know that um, we have two upcoming events uh, now that lockdown's finally starting to uh, ease and we're getting back to normality. On the 26th of June, uh, we have an event at Shiraz Republic up in Cornella, which is about 15 minutes sort of north-east-ish of our dark sky site. So it's about 20 or 30 minutes away from uh, north of sort of Heathcote. Uh, it's called Wine Under the Stars. Uh, so the tickets still available, so you get a drink, uh, dinner, and an evening with us. Looking through telescopes, not live stacking like this. We will do some live stacking onto a big projector. We'll do a tour of the night sky. We've got a quiz as well, but you'll actually be able to look through our telescopes as well. We'll have the 18-inch there. So there are still tickets available under the events section on our Facebook page and on our website. If you have a look at the main page of our website, it's there, as well as uh, coming up on the 29th of of June, we have Beer Astronomy at Tiny's Bar and Bottle Shop in Scoresby. A cheese platter, glass of beer, quiz, astronomy themed quiz, 
uh, Tour of the Night Sky, as well as uh, live viewing through telescopes there as well. Um, so if you're looking for something to do to sort of ease that lockdown pain and get back to some normality, um, there's two events that we've got coming up and tickets are still available for both of those events. Um, have a look on our Facebook page, as I said, under the events section or on our website on the front page. The links are there. Um, Caleb, what are we planning to stream next week if you are streaming? Uh, don't know if we are streaming. Just depends how everybody's feeling. Um, what everybody's up to, um, we may stream. We'll just see what happens. Um, we have been enjoying doing these streams, and if there's uh, a third instalment of of, of uh, our uh, movie themed uh, streams, then we might be able to call it a trilogy. We'll see what happens. Uh, now, Michael, I'll get you to jump on here and tell us what we're looking at. The little fuzzy blob is a galaxy. So if you want to unmute yourself and explain uh, what we're looking at, that would be... Hello, hello. Oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. That's all right. <laughs> I had to take everything off to unmute. So, yeah, basically uh, this is a little, uh, little old comet here, um, C2020T2 Palomar, discovered by the... Uh, Actually I'm, actually, I'm not too sure whether they used the five metre on this, <laughs> the, the hail. Um, so it was discovered well, uh, later, late last year. Um, it's arriving at perihelion on the 11th of July. It's got a distant object at 2.05. Um, when it gets to perihelion, it's currently uh, 2.08 from the sun and uh, 1.48 AU from Earth. So it's um, it's a rather distant object, but it's um, it's relatively intrinsically bright, as you can see by the very um, very bright nucleus there. Um, and these are only 30, 30 second exposures. Sorry, pardon. What magnitude is it at the moment? Yeah, ten point zero. Oh, okay. So it's yeah, pretty bright so then at the moment. It won't get much brighter, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, we're, we're hoping uh, towards the end of the year in, in uh, late December we, we may get a naked eye object which will be um, well suited in the southern hemisphere as well. Um, if, just an interesting comparison here, Michael. You know, we were looking at Mark Harry's chain and the elliptical galaxies. Uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, you, you can actually, when you see the comet that we're looking at there, you can actually understand why Charles Messier uh, developed his uh, his his um, his list of objects not to look at because they're not comets. Uh, because quite a few, you know, quite a few of them do actually look quite like comets. It's, it's very yeah, similar. I was just going to say that but, that know, comet, it's a comet, but it looks like a fuzzy. It could quite easily be an elliptical galaxy, couldn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's not, definitely. It's not fully clear that there's a tail, is it? No, no, exactly. I mean, if you look at that, there's a fuzzies whole lot of fuzzies. Fuzzies, it looks like a comet. That's a comet. So there's, so there's M84 and M86, uh, yeah. and they're pretty similar to comets. They are very similar to comets, and you can see why he did the list that he did when you look at that. look at it that way. Uh, for those of you who uh, don't know, Michael, um, or Captain America, um, is a bit of a comet nut and has <laughs> you've discovered some comets, is that right? Yeah, only, um, only... I, I cheated, though. I, I, I cheated, though. I didn't use my own equipment. I had to use a satellite in space. Doesn't matter. You still discovered a comet. <laughs> so I've got discovery any... credit for, for nine objects. I had to, The latest one there was in uh, late so February. You, so you've discovered nine comets. Yes. Yes, there we go. So we, we are lucky enough to have it, a member of part of our society who has discovered nine comets. But in no, in um, no way are these discoveries comparable to Charles Messier because he spent, uh, he spent his lifetime looking at the stars. I, I, I've got very, very little time, very little spare yeah, time on my hands to do that. You've thing. discovered nine more comets than everyone else on the stream tonight, so <laughs> <laughs> that's a, a fair effort. Um, oh, thank you, sir. So, no, it's a great effort. Like it's, and I think the well, the AC is proud to have you as one of its members, um, doing some wonderful science. So, I'm going to bring us all back up on screen. Drax the Destroyer has um, he's moving so slow. He's just joined us. That's how slow he's moving. Nobody saw it. Um, <laughs> 
I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. And if there is a third instalment and we make it a trilogy, we will we will let you know. So keep an eye out on our Facebook page. We'll see what happens. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm not doing anything next Friday night. So we'll see. Um, but uh, thank you, everyone, for coming along tonight. And we look forward to seeing you at the next stream. We'll see you next time. See you later. Bye. 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 Uh-huh.